About one-fourth or more of all PCI patients have diabetes, making them particularly challenging cases in the uh, cath lab. So to help some of the interventionalists, we have a guest today who has helped by co-authoring a contemporary review in cardiovascular medicine on coronary artery revascularization in patients with diabetes mellitus. Aaron J. Armstrong, you're currently at UC Davis, but you're about to go to the University of Colorado, where you're going to be the director of interventional cardiology at the VA up there. Thank I'm impressed. Much. Very nice. Well, thank you. I think it's a, it's a great institution and a great group there, so I'm very excited to join. Uh, a gorgeous Denver. state. It is indeed. We'll be doing a lot of cycling and skiing there. Let's talk about this paper in CERC because it's a topic that is really challenging. What are some of the issues dealing uh, with patients with diabetes in the catheterization laboratory? Well, I think, you know, there are a number of issues. As you uh, mentioned already, about a quarter of patients in the cath lab um, have diabetes uh, at the time when they undergo angiography and percutaneous coronary intervention. And I think we all recognize that patients with diabetes represent a high-risk group of patients, but I think that increasingly we're understanding that uh, they need to really undergo more intensive medical therapy, uh, both before and after cardiac catheterization. And I think there's also been some increased interest in uh, developing both stent technologies and perhaps medications uh, specific to patients with diabetes uh, to help uh, lower their risk of subsequent atherothrombosis and complications after percutaneous coronary intervention. When treating these patients, what are some of the things that an interventionist needs to keep in mind? Well, you know, I think the first thing that all interventionists can tell you is that patients with diabetes have more complex coronary disease as compared to other patients without diabetes. So that includes uh, more calcified lesions. Uh, they tend to have kind of more more diffuse coronary artery disease rather than focal lesions. And all of these things uh, reflect a more complex procedure uh, as compared to patients without uh, diabetes. Now, uh, after a procedure, however, it's also important for every interventionalist and general cardiologist to remember that uh, patients with diabetes have much higher rates of, of target vessel revascularization due to increased restenosis. They're also at much higher risk of stent thrombosis due to a more thrombotic neointima and activated platelets. So it's very important to consider the antiplatelet strategy, for example, in patients after they have undergone percutaneous coronary intervention. What about the appropriateness and timing of PCI in this population? Yeah, I think certainly appropriateness has become a very important issue that we've been discussing in the cardiology world. And I think it becomes increasingly difficult because much of the appropriateness criteria are also driven by symptoms and findings of ischemia. And what we do know is that patients with diabetes are considered to have a coronary risk equivalent even without defined coronary disease because they have a mortality at five years similar to patients with established coronary disease. In addition, patients with diabetes may have atypical symptoms, so they may not have typical angina that they present uh, to their primary care physician or general cardiologist with. So I think this makes it a very challenging subset of patients to look at uh, from a perspective of appropriateness criteria. Uh, the current uh, revised appropriateness criteria do not include diabetes as part of the risk stratification uh, regarding uh, the decision to revascularize. And I think this is reasonable in the sense that it's based on results of recent trials, including the Berry 2D trial, that didn't show an immediate, a benefit of immediate revascularization in those patients. However, it's also important to remember that uh, more than a quarter of those patients uh, during follow-up of a, a few years, even if they didn't undergo initial revascularization, did require revascularization. So I think uh, diabetic patients are a group that we have to pay a lot of attention to, uh, both from their symptomatology and evidence of objective ischemia, either by uh, uh, stress imaging or by, uh, for example, fractional flow reserve in the cardiac cath lab. There's been a lot of debate recently regarding whether you go through PCI or cabbage in this particular population. It's, it is really difficult to convince patients to have their chest cracked open. Where do you think this stands in terms of how aggressive would you be in, in telling a patient you really need bypass? Yeah, and I think this, this issue has really come to the forefront of uh, diabetics with multivessel disease in the last uh, six months, especially uh, with the results of the Freedom Trial. Uh, which, uh, as you know, involved patients with stable coronary disease and diabetes who were then randomized uh, to uh, percutaneous coronary intervention or coronary artery bypass grafting. 
And the results of this trial were pretty unequivocal in the sense that diabetics with multivessel coronary disease who underwent coronary artery bypass grafting had a significantly lower mortality at five years than patients who underwent percutaneous coronary intervention. And importantly, those curves didn't diverge for the first two or three years. It wasn't until years four or five that you really saw this mortality benefit. And it was also clinically significant. We, the mortality uh, in patients who underwent cabbage was about 11% versus 16% in the PCI group. So I think there really has been a shift in the last six months uh, in our revascularization strategy in the sense that I personally and a lot of other doctors I've talked to have uh, really taken seriously this issue of diabetics with multivessel coronary disease and have, uh, in many cases, uh, taken a step back and really advocated more strongly to patients for, uh, if possible, surgical revascularization. For those who undergo PCI, let's shift a moment and talk about some of the pooled analyses of studies that raise some controversy about the relative efficacy of different drug-eluting stent types in diabetes. Yeah, the, the issue of different drug-eluting stent types, I think, is a, a difficult one uh, that we don't have uh, answers to for sure because most of these results are result of secondary analyses uh, in studies. Um, I think it is worth noting, for example, in the Freedom trial that uh, essentially all of the stents used in that trial were first-generation drug-eluting stents as well, primarily serolimus or paclitaxel-eluting stents. When we look at the second-generation stents, we think we do know that they have a, a lower rate of target vessel revascularization and, and possibly a lower risk of stent thrombosis overall compared to first-generation stents. However, they've never been shown to have a mortality benefit, so it's difficult to extrapolate the effect of second-generation stents on diabetics as compared to the stents that were used in the, in the Freedom trial. Now, if we look at different second-generation drug-eluting stent types, Averolimus eluting stents uh, generally have uh, significantly improved efficacy uh, relative to some other stent types, including possibly paclitaxel eluting stents. However, interestingly, in, in post hoc analyses, uh, it was found that the relative benefit of Averolimus eluting stents appeared to disappear when stratified by diabetic patients, such that essentially all uh, drug eluting stent types seem to have uh, higher event rates in, in diabetic patients as compared to non-diabetic patients. So preferable to go for the second generation devices in these patients? I, I think in general that's true because all second generation uh, drug eluting stents, I think if you generalized uh, the results, have shown I think improved efficacy relative to first generation drug eluting stents and certainly bare metal stents uh, in reducing target vessel revascularization and possibly uh, a lower risk of stent thrombosis as well. Now besides your contemporary review and circulation, the American Diabetes Association recently pr produced some uh, physician resources for people who are looking for some help with their diabetic patients. Can you tell me about these resources? There are a number of resources that have to be taken into consideration uh, in patients with diabetes uh, because the most uh, efficacious intervention for a diabetic patient is not just going to be percutaneous intervention in the cath lab or surgical revascularization. Uh, a host of other factors need to be considered. Uh, this includes uh, adequate control of hyperglycemia. Um, although randomized trials of intensive uh, glucose control have met with mixed results, it is still recommended that patients who have a expected uh, life expectancy greater than five years should maintain a target hemoglobin A1C in the range of, of 7%. Additionally, every patient with diabetes, regardless actually of whether they have established coronary disease, uh, should take a statin medication, and aspirin should also be a strong consideration. I think in the specific case of post-percutaneous intervention, uh, in addition to aspirin, we also add on dual antiplatelet therapy, and based on the results of the, the triton timmy 38 trial and the PLATO trial, strong consideration should be given to more intensive antiplatelet therapy as the benefits in diabetic patients are at least as great and perhaps greater than the overall population with more intensive antiplatelet therapy. And try to get to optimal doses of all of these because study after study shows that, yes, they may be on the, the medication, but they're not even close to the, the doses studied. Yes, yeah, that's an even bigger issue uh, is getting people titrated to levels that are achieving actual optimal control. 
Well, we have, the paper is in circulation, and you'll get the reference, the citation at the very end of this video. For more on this particular topic and the rest of the coverage from TCT, please see Cardio Source World News. I'm Rick McGuire.